All right then. Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to uh, the Delhi Bird Foundation talk. And today we have a very, very special guest. I don't think she really needs an introduction to anyone who has, uh, who's been a member of Delhi Bird Picks or has ever seen her pictures, even one of them. It'll be like a completely, completely memorable experience. And um, I like to see the color of every feather of the bird and see the splendor of its plumage on the screen. And it's this relentless drive that has driven Jenny to cover all corners of the Indian subcontinent and across many, many foreign lands to photograph the bird life of this entire planet. Jenny, who actually has a doctorate in chemistry, took to bird watching about 10 years ago. And very soon, she began very serious bird photography. She travels most of the time. It could be to any destination in the country, especially the Northeast region, which she loves for its avian diversity. And also to other exotic bird-rich places like Papua New Guinea in search of the birds of paradise, or to Alaska for the snowy owl. And in less than 10 years of serious bird photography, she has photographed more than 1,100 birds in India, which is more than most of us have seen. Needless to say, her lens catches other forms of life too, and she has photographed more than 50 species of Indian mammals as well. Her photographs have been published in several national and international magazines, scientific journals, and bird books of great repute. So I will now hand it over to Jenny and share, let, tell her to please share some of her magic with us. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Sheila. It's a great introduction. You know, I'm like really overwhelmed to listen to this. <laughs> uh, so I'll try to do justice to what you said. Um, I'll try to showcase uh, some pictures uh, that I have taken and also some uh, interesting kind of experiences uh, behind uh, those pictures. So let me try my level best to keep you guys engaged today. Okay. So yeah, so uh, what you see is, uh, now on the screen is Malayan Night Heron. Can you see it? You, you are able to see, uh, see the screen, right? We are. Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay. So this is a very, very uh, elusive bird, as many of us know. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, sighting, uh, this is not uh, the picture of my first sighting. Uh, that that picture is not so great so but anyway i would like to kind of describe how it happened so it was like uh, i think some eight years ago or something like that so at that time i was like very very madly looking for the ceylon bay owl okay that time it was a lifer for me so um like Eldos in he he saw he thought like okay we would be able to see it if you really kind of um, uh, go to that urlantani forest area about like very early in the morning uh, so the idea was to kind of listen to the call of the bird and then track it in the uh, in the morning, in the early uh, morning. So that was the idea. And then we uh, reached there about 3 a.m. We heard the call. It was so beautiful. I never thought an owl could make such lovely, melodious call. So that was like kind of an experience for me, like in that forest, uh, like frequented by elephants and all. That's a kind of eerie feeling. It was like nice. Uh, but whatever it is, after we heard the call also, uh, we waited, we tried, but we didn't get the bird in the morning. Okay, it was like kind of a very dip, severe dip on the bird. And I was like, oh my God, oh, they, I didn't see it like that. Like, uh, then I thought, okay, probably next time like that. And uh, then uh, what happened was that uh, we just, okay, uh, we do not have this bird, let's do some, kind, some other birding on the roadside. So we just came out of that uh, forest patch and then walking on the road. And then uh, suddenly Eldos uh, was uh, showing like kind of uh, all kind of giving all kind of cues to me to look towards a path. And I was not getting it. Like I, I understood that he's trying to tell me something, but I didn't understand what it was. And then uh, like, you know, just a split second, I saw this bird like trotting inside. And that, when, that was my first shot and was like, uh, he was telling me then the importance of this bird. That this bird was also a life for me. And he was telling it's very, very difficult to see it. And uh, like, it's so great that we could see this at this point of time. 
so uh, that Malayan night tour and sighting will I will never forget because it was like a surprise sighting just walking on the road uh, we got to see that then after that I tried most almost around seven to eight years to get a good uh, shot of this bird in the northeast as well as in the south and then finally last year we got this image and it was like a, such a wonderful sighting Sanu was with me so the bird was like kind of uh, trying to catch uh, you know, some insects or some fish. I think it was a fish or like very tiny tadpoles. Uh, so there was a small kind of puddle in the rock and the bird was there for almost an hour. So that is how I got that, uh, that sighting. And this is uh, one of the images uh, that I made uh, that day but it always remains a very special sighting for me you know like uh, the, those many years back when i didn't know what it, the bird was uh, we were like kind of um, blessed with this sighting so like really nature surprises us in one way or the other so that was one beautiful sighting and then this one uh, the chestnut winged cuckoo uh, as we all know this is also a very diff difficult cuckoo to see um, we get to see it in the monsoon time in the northeast and also in the winter times in the south. Uh, but somehow or the other, I always missed this bird. It was like, I mean, like some glimpse I would see or that was, I think, one of my first birding trip in Idamalaya region in, like, in Kerala. I'd seen it for the first time. So, okay, uh, the lifer is kind of ticked, but I was not very happy with it. Um, so I wanted to get a good photo of this. And then, like, I was on the constant lookout for this bird. And then what happened one time when I was in Kerala in February 2017, uh, me and Danish, we were birding in Munar uh, region, okay, for improving some shots of the Nilgiri fly catchers, white-bellied uh, short wing, uh, et cetera, and so on. Like, whatever the Munar speciality is, uh, those beautiful birds. Then uh, it was like we were doing uh, birding in the gap road. So the connectivity was very less. So when we got to the town uh, for about, um, you know, at about uh, lunchtime, I think it was around 2 p.m. or something like that. When we opened our phones, so many messages started coming from Sanu that where are you, where are you, where are you, that uh, a chestnut winged cuckoo has been sitting in the same tree for three hours. Like, you know, my heart really sang when I heard this, like, because this bird was one which I was really looking for to make a good shot. And then three hours, the bird on a same tree was something which I could not, you know, kind of digest when I am not there. Actually, from Munar to go to this region where uh, to see this bird, it was just one and a half to two hours uh, drive, uh, drive only. So we could have really made it. And then, like, it was very, very sad. And then uh, Sanu was telling me, uh, telling me, Madam, don't worry. That, uh, that tree is full of like small caterpillars or like larvae. So there's a high probability that tomorrow also the bird might come. So to the same tree. So again, at the, in the next day, during the daybreak, we were there like around 6.30. It was just, uh, uh, sun, uh, just the, at the sunrise, we were there. And then uh, there was a like uh, in a very nearby small tree, there was this crimson, um, the Malabar barbet uh, nesting. So I was like enjoying it. But my all, always my, uh, you know, kind of attention on, was on that tall tree where the cuckoo is supposed to come. So we were like waiting there, waiting there. And then by 8 o'clock or 9, 8.30 or something, so many other birders also started coming to that area. And since I was standing there, and then like I had to mention that I'm trying to kind of get a cuckoo sighting, then people all started like being there around because even if they didn't know what was the importance of this bird, uh, since uh, like we mentioned it, people were always like curious uh, to uh, stand there and try to see this bird. And that like that, it became 9, 9.30. That uh, previous day, it has already come by 9 o'clock. So this time already, it's like 9, 9.30. And still, there is no sight of the bird. And then I thought, okay, my God, gone. Like that. <laughs> and then around like 9.45 or 10 o'clock, we just saw it flying. Just a glimpse. It just started uh, uh, flying towards the tree. Whether it landed on the, on the tree is like that much fleeting glimpse only. Okay, we just... It didn't land, basically. It just kind of made, made a sortie and then flew off. 
um, so then all the people who were uh, other birders also started like kind of uh, um, going in the direction where in which the cuckoo flew when i was standing there i didn't know what was happening i was like kind of oh my god i'm just going to miss this also this time like that i am like standing there like without any kind of movement then my sanu and danish tell uh, are telling me madam if you are standing there you are not going to get it let us go and chase this bird like wherever it is going let us try to find where it is uh, going so like that then we we go we went we, we went into the forest then like went a little bit ahead almost one hour or something we just kind of tried to search for the trees or the kind of uh, that hunting a flock um, uh, to uh, to follow it and then uh, finally we just felt that the cuckoo is around in that hunting flock and but we were not able to see it and then finally like we after made, making all this sorty we thought the cuckoo is like the uh, somebody i mean danish saw, uh, saw the cuckoo and the cuckoo was kind of darting back to the same tree then we just ran back to the same place that initial tree and then it was there you know then it starts uh, it was staying um, like for almost like an, an, an hour or so people made all sort of pictures and that was the time i made this uh, picture too so that was a very um, kind of like a, a very birding on hormone kind of uh, sighting uh, for this cuckoo they really enjoyed it then uh, this is the goliath heron so i think last uh, time we last recent sighting was about like 7 years back i think if i am, i remember correctly it was in 2013 uh so we uh, uh we head uh, headed to sundarbans uh, for this bird and arka was with us arka sarkar so he he also wanted to see the bird so we tried um, to search for um, slaty backed fly catchers and also the asian uh, stub tail which was in the rabindra sarobar uh, before heading to sundarbans so we had all this uh, birds in our uh, uh, target but we didn't i we saw the uh, no we didn't even uh, see the slaty back i think we we didn't see both but then we went to sundarbans and uh, around noon noon time um we saw this bird from far it, it stands really tall so it's very easy to see this from far and uh, to compare the sizes i have seen, uh, given that uh, indian pond heron crossing uh, the goliath heron uh, so this was like A very beautiful uh, sighting. Um, not uh, too much of effort in that way because Arka was there with us and he had uh, uh, done all the homework. Uh, the probability of sighting uh, on which uh, which uh, part of the of the Sundarbans, etc. So we had a very good sighting. And um, that trip, we actually also had the targets of uh, ruddy kingfisher as well as the buffy fish owl. so towards the end of the day uh, when all the sightings are over like uh, on, on when the goliath sightings are over uh, we tried to uh, search for the ruddy kingfisher as well as the buffy fish owl so it was like uh, we tried but then we didn't get any response um, and by that time the boat was uh, nearing a, a tower tower area and it was like kind of uh, uh, getting uh, like uh, anchored for some time and then i thought okay let me just go and freshen up so i just bent uh, in uh, down uh, in the bunker and uh, the engine of the boat was still whirring so i could not hear anything outside i didn't expect any sighting also so i took my really nice time to like freshen up and then when I, when i opened the bunker door the boatman is shouting ma'am ma'am there is a tiger sighting going on in the tower all we have tried to call you multiple times and then you know you are not able to hear and run you might be able to see it and then like i don't know how i reached the tower i really really ran up and then by the time i just a few seconds before i reached the tower the tiger was gone it is like it is such a miss uh, that then i asked our co did you really see the tiger that he said yes can i see the photograph then he said really you don't want to see this picture jaini then i told i still want to see it and then he showed me it is such a beautiful tiger sightings and i really could not believe that i missed it so i think it's in sundarbans even if uh, i think i am like very very famous now in that that okay that madam who missed the sighting 
for like about 15 minutes. The tiger was about 15 minutes there and still I missed it. So I have not uh, been able to get a tiger sightings from Sundar Sundarbans yet, but that was the greatest story of my miss of that uh, Sundarban tiger. So this, uh, this photo always reminds me of that trip and the kind of miss that I had to um, on, the, on, on tiger. And then we'll go to Blythe's Kingfisher. So this is, um, uh, as we all know as birders, this is one of our favorite, I mean, one of our sort uh, after Kingfishers. Um, so this was my last Kingfisher uh, for uh, the subcontinent. So I tried my level best. So Peter Lobo, he uh, told me that he had seen this bird uh, some 10 years back in a particular area in Namdafa. So uh, that particular day, um, we started from the Hornbill camp about 3 a.m. Then we walked about like um, maybe around 20 kilometers to reach the Namdafa River area first. And uh, then uh, there was uh, like elephants, um, one elephant was waiting for us there. Um, uh, to take us uh, across the river because um, we had to cross the river uh, at three different places to reach the spot. So the elephant was there and then I was really feeling very, very happy because, okay, after this many long stretches, uh, stretch of walking, uh, it, I finally get to sit and relax. That was my, my thought when I saw the elephant. Okay, so Chavang was the guide. I mean, rather naturalist along with me, Chavang uh, Bhutia from Sikkim, and then Jabang Ji, a great forest of, uh, forest um, employee from uh, from Namdafa. Uh, then, uh, like, uh, so we were set out to go to this particular area. Uh, so, like, uh, so we uh, our packed lunch was also waiting. So we took the lunch and then we climbed over the elephant. So it was like, there was no like couch for the safari or sort of, that was not the thing. We had to sit cross-legged on the elephant. So like five minutes into the, into that, uh, into the journey, I started feeling terribly painful to sit on the elephant. It was so difficult. Like with the, with the kind of that movement of the elephant, like this, since we are sitting, sitting cross-legged, it was difficult. It was like, I felt like, you know, my, the small of my back is going to break apart. So that was the kind of feeling uh, to sit on the elephant. Um, I never thought that would be such a painful experience. I just wanted the journey to end, whatever. It, it had to go for about like one and a half to two hours to reach the spot. Uh, so by, I think, two o'clock, uh, I mean, I mean by, my, by, I think, 3.30 or something, we were there. And uh, I was sitting on one, um, one boulder in the river uh, where... Uh, uh, in the, uh, where the uh, previous sighting has been recorded. So sit there about like one and a half uh, to two hours, uh, seeing all other, watching all other birds, but no sign of kingfisher or white-bellied heron. I was also looking for white-bellied heron in that area. Not, not except these birds, all these normal birds, like bulbuls, all of them were flying around. Um, and lot of dum-dum, that um, sand fly bites also. It's like a lot of them, swam of them, um, so, but anyway, we were braving all that. And then finally, um, Jabang Ji, he, he came and told, ma'am, I don't think now, probably, uh, maybe it might have uh, shifted the area. Uh, we should head back now because it is getting dark. Um, elephants will not be able to cross the river if we are wait, waiting again. And then I just, okay, my, like, it's a, it's a feeling that, you know, you just, you are like a whole day of hard work. You are re, 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 reaching um, after all this. Uh, and then uh, when you want to leave that, when you, you have to leave that place, it's a different kind of feeling. So I told, okay, can, can't we wait? We cannot wait, right? Like this kind of conversation was happening. And then uh, I just stood up to go. And then suddenly just flew across, like in just front of us, short past us. And since it was flowing river, and uh, I felt that it's not a common kingfisher. And then I, uh, then what I could think was the, of the Blythe's Kingfisher. So it was like, it just shot past us and it was, we were not able to like kind of shoot it in that speed, but then we tried to follow it. And fortunately it kind of perched in a, a small um, kind of a branch, which was uh, visible from the place where we were standing, but it was still very far away. And that time I was carrying like 300 mm so it was not a very far-reaching lens. So, but anyway, I had 2x uh, converter on the on the 300. So 
so i thought okay i have to just pursue along the uh, side of the river to uh, get a minimum uh, possible focusing distance and uh, uh, i mean uh, to to get a reasonably uh, at least at least a silhouette kind of picture so i i walked and then um, i mean it's not kind of walking it's like kind of wading through the river like lot of boulders and many of them slippery so we had to be very very careful um, and uh, this was the uh, so when we were very close to that place then again uh, the bird flew and i thought gone now it's gone but it just flitted across to the other branch so that was the sighting um, uh, which we had uh, i think in 2014 uh, it was so beautiful and still this uh, image is one of my favorite images though i was able to make much better uh, like close uh, distance images from pake um, a couple of years back uh, this image is always very dear to me because of the hard work um, which we had put in and the kind of like last minute kind of boon from the heaven uh, it's a kind of benevolence um, uh, whatever so i really uh, count it as one of my best birds uh, which i have shot till now and uh, that particular trip was very fruitful otherwise also namdafa is always whatever even if you are not able to make very excellent pictures uh, because of the canopy all over the place uh, for birds it is one of the best uh, i was able to see the snowy throated babbler uh, then was able to see um, uh hawks's frog mouth uh, from namdafa i think one of the first photographs of the male bird from from the country at that time then also small toothed uh, palm civet all these very beautiful beautiful sightings uh, we got in that trip so that is one of the best trips um, which we had in terms of the sightings uh then uh, tenning stragopan um, this is one of um, a very um, a beautiful uh, stunner tragopans as we know we have four tragopans uh, in our country which we can see um, the western tragopan in the western himalayan side and all the other ones in the east i mean also the satyr in the munsiyari western himalayas uh, plus um, all the uh, other uh, tragopans in the east like tamings and the blights including the subspecies so blight tragopan uh, was my lifer uh, that time in december 2015 um, so uh, it was like uh, i had a month long birding with uh, rafiq one of the best um, naturalist i have seen out in the field so um, it was december uh, 2015 uh, the whole month so we were trying to look for uh, target species moving from place to place uh, so that whole uh, we were not planning anything particularly like this many days for this uh, this bird we were like kind of having the target and the trying to look for uh, that in the particular area and then moving on so without any booking uh, uh, that that was the kind of trip, uh, trip we had and it was amazing so uh, so then this uh, tragopan came up in our um, discussion so uh, rafiq said like uh, like okay this is very very difficult in the month of december usually tragopans are uh, known to be seen in the month of april and may when they are like you know in the breeding time and then calling to each other uh, calling out to each other that's the best time to see the tragopans um, so we just we just tried our luck so um we uh, we tried to uh, take the path from the eagle nest pass uh, where rafiq had seen this bird many times uh, um, before so he told this is the area best area which he would suggest so we went we started trekking inside um, like um, uh, up and then um, the path was like full of elephant uh, dung and so it was like an active path for the elephants but not probably in the winter uh, from the uh, kind of dung we figured that it's a little bit old so we were like kind of okay to kind of uh, follow the trek path so like that we were going going and then the feet kept on pushing let's ma'am let's go a little further let's go a little further so this is like you know this this bird is basically attributed to i mean the kind of uh, his uh, his perseverance you know the way he tried to push me up uh, like uh, to uh, to see this bird so i always uh, i am grateful to him for this particular sighting uh, so like that we we kept on going up and then we finally reached a rhododendron kind of patch it was a very beautiful setting i mean anybody any photographer or the, or a birder would love to see the tragopan in such lovely setting even though the uh, the 
the um, flowers were not in bloom or the it was like that that feel of the forest was like immaculate and it is so beautiful so i really wished i mean both of us really wished to see the tragopan in that area so uh, rafiq suggested that we we sit very 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 quiet um, and then and then try for this bird so like that we we sat on a dead uh, tree log uh, with very minimum movement okay like very quiet and then finally after 15 minutes or so we could really hear that something is walking towards us it was like footfall like a slow rustle um, i mean you have to be really really kind of um, um very attentive or like very very watchful uh, that sort of uh, that that kind of mental frame otherwise we could have easily missed also it was like eerily silent and something like heavy fall on the on the ground walking towards us trotting towards us so then just we again like we were just okay i i, I had 500 mm in my hand i know that you know i was i would not be able to make very good images with it at very close range but still i was holding it like with bated breath and then finally it appeared but i didn't want to shoot it unless and until um it gave me a little bit window but it was not giving me a window like that it was just moving through the clumps and then slowly made a sortie around us and then went back so that was the time i i kind of tried to make this shot it's not a great shot but i really love it it is such an experience to see a tragopan a beautiful pheasant in the month of december in that biting cold so it was really beautiful um so that was the image one of the image i clicked that time it didn't get really focused the bird was like it was in a hurry it made it, it 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 was it really understood that we were making a full of him or something like that it really understood uh, felt our presence and then just vanished into the into the thickets um then later on uh, in mandala a couple of years back there was like one beautiful um, sighting area where i think shashank um, had probably uh, got an idea uh, of it so shashank had um, uh, mentioned this area to mohan kemparaju and uh, atanu both of them are bangalore based uh, bird birders i think now mohan is in the uk so uh, they were um, also there when we were birding me vinod ogo with we were birding in mandala so we uh, the first day they kind of got an um, mohan and atanu they got an um, uh, you know kind of uh, i think a uh, fleeting glimpse of the bird so then the next day they again went and so they kind of shared this info uh, to us so we also went uh, the next day after they are done and then we were like sitting in a in a particular area uh, waiting for this bird to cross uh, to the other side of the uh, road so since they have given us all the information we were all set so we were like very early in the morning uh, right at the time so we to, we sat there two days like morning and as well as evening uh, to get a picture of it we finally got a very good picture but that's uh, in that fog and in that cold sitting for that those many hours was like kind of like a it was a it, it was really a testing time so to the point that we were actually praying for the fog to come up uh, so that you know under that pretext we can leave because um, we didn't want to leave but we were so tired uh, that we have to leave uh, like that but anyway third day morning we got a very good sighting um, so it was like a beautiful uh, kind of now when i turn uh, turn back it, it really feel very 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 nice um and very funny uh, one point like i kind of i was like kind of lying down on the uh, on the ground um then even a crow or a raven or something they came and checked like when somebody other, other person who was sitting on the other side was telling me so this is like kind of things we birders undergo or the crazy things which we do to get what we need so teming stragopan um kind of sighting was like that so i had uh, i think three uh Uh, two beautiful sightings so the second time mandala the picture was really beautiful we had gotten the full bird but uh, yeah it would not have been possible without the help of like uh, the friends um, like uh, mohan anatanu and of course shashank who get a lot of information about this bird um 
then this is grey peacock pheasant, the same like in December 2015 when we were doing uh, a trip, um, I mean when me and Rafiq were on the trip in the northeast, we saw this bird twice, twice, so close range and very clickable distance, but we still could not click it, but because the moment I was racing it, the bird was getting spooked, it was like so close, I mean that feeling of uh, that missing the bird, like it is, it will never go from you unless and until you click the bird. But still, that will stay with you. Uh, so, so like that, we we missed the bird twice in Deking Patkai, very close range. Um, but somehow, both of us could not convert uh, it into a picture. And uh, this one was uh, made later from Dampa, Mizoram. Uh, so the, we were on the lookout for the blue pitta uh, in the forest. Uh, when uh, so we were trying for the blue pitta with several areas of Mizoram. So this particular uh, forest, Dampa, very beautiful um, kind of long forest stretch, uh, stretch as well as the trekking path. Um, so we were like um, uh, walking uh, through one of this um, ranch path, uh, I mean the, the trek path. And then we heard this call. This, the call is very unmistakable as many of you might have experienced it. Um, so it was very unmistakable call. And then uh, Danish was with me and then we were just mentioning, okay, we, we should probably try this bird. Maybe we can just go and sit very quietly a little bit far and uh, try whether the bird, uh, try our luck, whether the bird will, uh, would really cross us. So actually, uh, since many, uh, we, many of us know that Pheasants, uh, they are very um, known to cross uh, the road uh, or the path um, most of the times, especially uh, like when the call is heard near that path, they are sort of bound to cross uh, that um, path to the other side. So like that, um, I, I had 500 mm in my hand, so it was quite good for me to wait for this bird at a pretty, um, I mean, at a distance quite far from where we, we heard the call. So like that, we were sitting at a very, very comfortable distance. And then slowly, slowly, it's, sometimes these pheasants are so intelligent that they kind of stop the call when they probably feel something. But anyway, the bird didn't call, but slowly its head, the gray head started popping out of, the, of that kind of dried leaves. We have to be really watchful. Then only we could see that, you know, that kind of... It's a drab colored bird head uh, and then slowly coming up and then slowly, slowly the body, full body came into visibility. And I was really, really waiting to make that first shot because I didn't want to spook the bird so that, you know, I won't end up with any pictures like the previous experience always matters. You know, so I was like very, very waiting till the bird came into the full uh, view of my lens. So I made a couple of pictures and uh, this is one of it. It's such a beautiful bird. And that blue uh, of the ocella, that, that ocella was like kind of like so glittering in, uh, in that um, filtered sunlight uh, through the forest floor. It's so beautiful sighting. I, I would see, uh, I would rate this as one of my best bird sightings. Um, very unexpected. Um, uh, I mean, though the calls can be heard at different parts uh, in the Northeast, um, it's very, very difficult uh, to see. I've seen very, very few pictures of this bird also. Um, many of the time we end up with like, you know, we get excited and then we try to shoot the bird in that excitement and the bird, um, you, you end up with shooting either its beak or its tail or something like that. So um, my experience with Rafiq um, in December really helped me to make this picture at a later point of time. Um, then Tibetan Snowcock. Um, this is also one of my uh, favorite sightings in, in that this happened during my first Ladakh uh, trip. My first ever Ladakh trip to uh, a, a trip, uh, trip, which I, I think it was in 2010 or uh, some, I think 10. So that time I didn't have much idea about uh, these birds. So what all I had was the checklist which um, Garima uh, had sent me. So she had uh, uh, gone to this area and she had um, uh, seen many birds and they, they were they're very systematic people, Garima, Rajneesh, all of them, they really kind of maintain a very good list. I'm not that kind of very systematic, but I um, try to get the information possible. So they, I had their checklist with them, with me. Um, 
so but i did expect it they didn't see it probably so i will never see it that is the kind of notion always i have like if very good experts or good birders do not see it uh, probably i am like okay type so like that is the way i kind of um, that is kind the kind of feeling i always have so i didn't expect this was not in my radar so i went um, and uh, then from i think from sokar to somariri when we were uh, going on in the car we saw these birds say around eight of them at the bend at a bend um, so it was um, it was like they were like statues you know they were not moving um, but they were not shy as well. they didn't try to kind of trot away uh, but they were alert and watchful and like they just stood they 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 were like statues so i made some couple of saw, uh, shots and this uh, then i had to really come back and check the list okay which bird did i see that was my uh, experience that time you know i didn't have um, much uh, knowledge about this bird then i came back i ticked i was very very happy to see um, the bird and then uh, then the next uh, snowcock we have is like only the himalayan snowcock right so the himalayan snowcock i might have tried a lot of times before i finally made this uh, picture so many people would know about this story is like pooja sharma i had asked her like you know she gave me some inputs where we could see so i tried to uh, see this uh, check for this bird in different parts like in spiti valley mud area um, the, the tara homestay the famous tara homestay um, uh, staying there and uh, trekking up uh, from uh, the other place um, so to to get them um, uh, because they possibly try to come and uh, for their morning uh, fill up of the water so i i had done all these things like many many times over years uh, to get a glimpse of the himalayan snowcock finally one in december also i tried i uh, three four days i tried uh, but then because i felt okay it's so cold up so they should come to lay uh, lay or like you know surrounding areas uh, so that i i have a better chance but i missed that time also that the following april um again we tried and then uh, spontaneously one army person he had told me that um, he had seen this bird regularly at a place uh, coming to drink water in the morning so uh, we fixed a time with him and then we went back to lay and uh, the next day early morning we started so that we can uh, reach that area it was north kulu so we uh, crossed the kardungla and then we were on our way to north kulu when we saw a, a massive truck Uh, you know kind of stuck in the snow right in the road in the middle of the road even though our car was small we didn't have even a small window to pass uh, the truck we try to explain to the driver he was also trying his level best but he could not do anything and the bro uh, people had to come and um, remove uh, the truck so i was like very very sad you know it is kind of an inexplicable feeling like i mean i didn't know what to do in that high altitude my brain was not kind of functioning i was angry i was like kind of sad i was uh, like one uh, like tears started uh, dripping down my uh, eyes i didn't know what to do it was like almost a sure sighting and then i'm still going to miss it that was the feeling the time was very important as we all know because that morning time if you miss it's it's a high chance that we miss the bird so we again turned back from that area and then again when we were about to reach the south kulu area we heard this birds like around uh, we heard this and then i my driver um, he was telling like ma'am it's a ribza that is the local name for snowcocks there the ribza calling that is like so beautiful to uh, to get that feeling you know uh, in that vast space to hear so many birds calling crowing um so right uh, there uh, when we stopped the vehicle it was all there around around 35 to 40 of them we could see in that uh, single day so it was so beautiful um against the snow uh, uh, to see that bird um so i followed some birds which were for going down um try to get some good pictures um so this is one of the pictures um, uh, we could make that day and uh, later on i had uh, seen uh, several um, 
times um, thanks to Rajesh Panwa, uh, he, he had mentioned to me several locations in uh, Ladakh where to look for this bird and uh, the timing also. So it becomes very easier. So more eyes and more kind of information always help in such vast expanse. So uh, it's like um, um, I had seen many times afterwards, but uh, this sighting always is very, very important to me because the kind of um, the hard work which has gone behind it. Then golden eagle. Similarly, um, we had a lot of uh, uh, tough time to see this bird perched. I always saw it in soaring high up, but I never got to see it perched. And I wanted a shot like that, uh, perched shot of the golden eagle. So I had um, Ladakh, of course, and it's a very important area to look for, and also in Spiti. So when once I was in Kibber area, um, so somebody told me that's a pair of golden eagle nesting out there in the cliff. So we took a tractor there uh, to go up uh, the terrain and then we reached there. Um, we stood for uh, almost two, three hours, uh, but the parents didn't turn up. We could see the chicks, um, but it, the weather was so, uh, so inclement, a lot of wind. Um, so I had to come back after four hours, three, four hours of um, um, being in that particular spot. The, the nest was so far away. I mean, they always make uh, their nest so cautiously, like far end of the cliff. Um, so, but anyway, um, we, we saw the chicks. So then again, uh, came back. Then once, um, just random birding uh, and somewhere in Ladakh, um, I saw something uh, like a raptor sitting down uh, in a, near a tree. And I thought like probably it could be a lamar gear or, or just like from far. But then uh, just tried to, when I uh, um, looked through the bins, it was clear that it's a golden eagle. Um, so then I tried to take a lot of time to approach it because I didn't want to miss the bird. So I think I might have taken about two hours uh, to approach this bird, taking the, um, you know, um, approaching it stealthily, taking the cover of boulders wherever possible. So slowly, slowly I approached the bird. And the bird was just there uh, it, to the point that I thought that the bird is probably injured. But whatever it is, like, okay, let me make some good shots. So I was just near it. It is just for five, this shot is full frame, shot with a 500 F4. That close I was. Um, then I returned back after shooting. And then when I was about to reach the road, I just turned back and check whether uh, the bird is still there to have a last look, you know, that kind of uh, thing. Then the bird was not there, so it had already flown. Um, then I noticed that the three, four of them perching at the same area in different parts of the cliff. So that was a, like kind of a super sighting of like three, four golden eagles at the same place, all perched. Uh, then later in the last December also, we got a very good sighting with a very good kill, etc. But as I say, uh, always these kind of pictures make us, um, you know, work towards that inspire us to do uh, much more. Uh, uh, out there in the field. Then white brow tick wobbler, beautiful, one of the beautiful wobblers as we all know. Um, so this one also I had uh, tried a lot of uh, um, times in Ladakh. So every seabuck thorn bush is like I was looking forward to one wobbler. Actually. I mean, that that is the kind of desperate uh, situation I was in. So this particular time when we shot the bird, uh, that was also... Um, a lot of um, information and a lot of hard work. So uh, this, uh, what, um, so me and Danesh, uh, my husband, we, both of us were birding and he was trying to kind of help me out uh, to uh, check for small birds because in Ladakh, as we know, um, um, the, uh, the sightings are directly proportional to the number of eyes out there in the field. So he was also trying to help me. And uh, we were uh, trying to look for this in Nubra Valley for about five days. Um, and then we came back to Leh. So that time Praveen uh, Jay, there when Praveen Jay, Dibu, uh, Vijay Mohan, they were all birding. Uh, in, uh, they had already just birded and then got back to Leh. And then we tried to catch up with them over dinner. So then uh, Dibu uh, and Praveen, they mentioned that, okay, uh, Garima, uh, she, uh, Garima, Rajneesh, etc. they, they uh, saw this bird just a week before in this particular area. Uh, then uh, he told me to call, uh, just ask Garima about it. And I just immediately called Garima and she just told me the right spot where, where she uh, saw the bird. And she also told me how to approach the bird. 
that probably the bird will not respond to the call, but it might just come up at the top of the Sibakthorn bush and just give you a sighting, probably. That is what she said. And that was such a, a great direction and such an information that, you know, I could utilize it fully. So then the next day again, I was about to go to, I mean, I wanted to go to Nubra Valley. When like, the, my husband, they, they were just looking at me, you really want to go again and try? I thought, yeah, I want to. And if you do not want to come, don't come. I am just going. So anyway, he also came. And then we reached this particular area near Panamik. And uh, um, Garima's directions were so helpful that we were just at the right field where she, see, she has seen the bird. And then, um, so I was holding the camera and Danish was help me, helping me to kind of um, sort to, uh, sort of play the call. Uh, so he tried for a long time. And I mean, we were there almost about half an hour to 45 minutes. And then he went back to the car for something else. And then he gave me the phone and the camera. Um, camera anyway, I was holding it and the, he had gave me the phone. So I had uh, the camera in my right hand and the phone in the left hand and then since anyway he's gone i just casually i tried you know then this bird pops up right in front of front of me i don't know what to do i mean just was a few seconds and then uh, i just made this only one this shot and that was the only some seconds it might have given me and uh, so this was like that kind of uh, 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 time when uh, really luck favored me and the, my reflexes really worked in favor of me so that is this um, uh, sighting, the white brow tit wobbler. And then later, I uh, had several sightings of this uh, bird, even from the Ladakh and also from Tawang area. But uh, this is always a significant, uh, beautiful sighting. Nicobar Begapod, we know that, you know, it's one of the um, uh, unique birds uh, which we have in Indian subcontinent in India. Um, so uh, Nicobar Megapod, uh, for the first time when I tried, um, it wasn't great Nicobar for sure. Um, we had a lot of um, um, trouble to reach at least uh, the mound nest. Uh, so the locals uh, who had accompanied us, uh, he he mentioned that uh, uh, you know there are mound nests in uh, in some areas where he knows and he. Um, I was kind enough to take us there. So me, then these local uh, folks, then Vikram Shield, the naturalist from um, Port Blair, he was there. Um, then his one of his friends, Sanjay, I think he was um, his um, civil um, servant in Nicobar. So that also helped a lot. So we um, we went and we we kind of had to go through the swamp area. Uh, so while going, um, most of the time, this local person, he was telling that, you know, what happened in this um, swamp areas after the tsunamis happened, tsunami has happened, so much crocodiles have found their way inwards, so we have to be careful in the swamps. And also, so these kind of discussion was going on while we were on the, on the trek. It is like full uh, kind of mud mar, uh, um, and uh, slush. So we, we had to really uh, lug our way through uh, the slush. So uh, like that we were going and then we reached a particular area where there was a small stream. And then uh, the local friend, he says, uh, he said that, okay, this is full of water now. There was no water earlier like that. And the, the water was really murky. We could not see anything from the top. And there was a small kind of log to cross it uh, to the other side. So since we and the, the log, the water was on the top of that small uh, log. So we could not see anything because the water was so really murky. And then I didn't want to give up at that time. If the, although this co crocodile stories, uh, they're kind of really kind of very, very um, uh, spooky. And I, I, I really felt that in me that I'm one of the uh, rarest birding times when I really fear, felt that fear. What if there is one something there inside because we can't see anything from the top. So uh, it was that kind of a situation, but I didn't want to give up. Uh, he was telling that it's just a few um, um, meters away from uh, after we cross the path, after we cross the log. So anyway, then I requested them, can you hold the camera for me? And then they were very happy to hold the camera and then requested them to give me a big stick um, sort of thing. So what I, my idea was to uh, use the support of the stick, um, holding, I mean, uh, holding it in the water and then jump. 
So that is how I did that. So kind of almost a pole vault to to reach the side of the of the street. But anyway, we reached there, um, and uh, um, the mount nest was so so huge. I never felt that the mount nest could be so huge. It was almost eight feet high, um, and full of like the that kind of um, it, uh, the loose soil. But it was not an active nest, I think. Uh, but whatever it is, we dipped the bird. And later on, I understood that if we go in so many, um, like so many people together, we are never going to see that bird. It requires extreme kind of quietness because it's a very, very shy bird um, and very, very drab bird. And we, we need to be really careful to really see it. So that I figured later point of time, but that, that was the first experience. So anyway, when this um, picture was made, um, this was uh, later, um, I think in 2016. Uh, so that time, uh, what happened was that uh, the forest employees, uh, they always used to walk us uh, to the mound uh, where these birds uh, are probably kind of working on. And uh, so they make a kind of um, hide, natural hide from the, from the fronds of the palm, palms extra nearby. So we are at a very reasonable distance. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of, that is the way we get to see it. Otherwise, uh, we can see it, but it's difficult uh, to get a photo. Um, so um, we, I was sitting um, in, in the hide quite a, at a reasonable distance. Um, so, so they they uh, they kind of drop us in the hide, and then they come to fetch us back um, after some time, like around ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, uh, back. So uh, I was sitting, and I was like, so there's a very small opening where you can see it, and we can keep our camera lens. That's all it is. And then um, after some time, about a, an hour or two, I hear that the forest like kind of. Um, spring up to life within like squeaks, startling screeches screeching above me so all kinds of weird kind of sounds so i then like i was thinking like what is happening and then i saw this uh, the huge reticulated python just over the mountainous it's just cro uh, crossing it and going to the other side i mean i don't i actually did not know did not know where it went if I knew that the, the python had gone to the other side, I would have been peaceful. But I had never, I had, I had no way to know where it had gone because I was completely in an enclosure with very, um, very um, less, uh, you know, kind of visual, um, I mean, less area open to me. So then I was like, I didn't know what to do. I was very scared as well. So I wanted to just give time for me to take a deep breath and then just jump out of the hide and uh, stay in an open area where I could know uh, that if the snake, um, you know, is in my vicinity, I mean, they will not do anything to us, but unless and until we come to know about it, I mean, that, that situation was a difficult kind of situation for me. So I just ran out, of, I mean, jumped out of that hide and then uh, stood in that open area for about one and a half to two hours till they come, came to fetch me. So that was interesting um, to um, see that bird in that kind of setting. I also saw a monitor lizard uh, raiding uh, the mound nest. So they are uh, sort of a kind of threat to these uh, ground dwelling birds, the monitor lizards as well as python. I saw it with my own eyes. So uh, yeah, this is one of the serious uh, concern for uh, their, um, I mean, serious cause probably for their population decline. Then um, beach pygmy. This is also one another interesting um, bird, which um, one of my last pygmies for the Indian subcontinent. So uh, the first time when I make, made a shot, it was like very, very difficult. Uh, it was hilarious. So what happened was that some, um, I think again, um, probably Shashank uh, had some information from Annette or uh, something like that. So Vikram had an inkling where um, we could see this bird. So we had to take um, the help fishermen to reach uh, the area and uh, what uh, happened was that you know this boat um, I mean this particular uh, island which is off south Port Blair uh, a couple of hours they, they it d didn't have a natural uh, shore so it was like kind of coral reef and uh, so the boat cannot reach um, the shore uh, so you, we had to time it in such a way that um, uh, in the in the high tide when the when the um, when the boat is like just above the trough we have to uh, jump into the water and then um, 
walk toward the, uh, towards the shore so that was the scenario so actually it was no, not so very difficult to jump into the sea but the problem that sinking you know the how to how do we sink ourselves to get into the water was a main thing and also another serious concern for me was the my camera how do i protect my camera i didn't have a um, waterproof bag or something like that but i just had a normal kind of um, you know a bag um, with some waterproof uh, co covers in it like bubble wrap that is how i just usually pack my camera so but the fortunately the driver who accompanied us he he was very tall so um, i felt that okay if uh, you know he if he could help us um, that would be really great and anyway he is uh, such a nice person uh, he is such a nice person gopal um, so he uh, he kind of agreed to carry the camera on his um, top the suit the kind of bag on his uh, that on the top of his head and uh, he walked a show so then camera is safe now for me now it is the jumping thing i had to just sink it in when you are about to jump into the sea you uh, you just don't know whether you'll be <laughs> able to do it so that was a different kind of feeling you know but anyway i jumped, jumped and uh, the water was up to my neck it was that kind of um, deep so we went there um, so uh, the the sun was already blazing hot and the sand it was so difficult to walk through the sand so we tried wherever possible there was a land mass we were walking through the land land mass and i think we saw a lot of parakeet red breasted parakeets then andaman woodpeckers along the way but we were not not able to see this birds which we had come really looking for so then after finally one and a half to two hours vikram told me like ma'am i don't think now probably the birds are not here they might have kind of got shifted to some other area so then uh, what happened it's like it happens to all of us you know i have noticed it several times so i i saw a, a rocky kind of area like a coral area only a little bit far so i told vikram that okay now we have actually come up to this point of time so let us just walk up to that you know probably we could see that from the habitat we know that okay uh, these birds are seen in the coral reefs plus the sand shore type so um we uh, so we started walking towards that area and then so vikram was ahead of us about 100 meters and then me and gopal we were just uh, uh, walking behind and then suddenly ahead from uh, in front of the in vikram uh, just uh, these two birds just flew and then sat in front of us just so close to me i mean it was not scared nothing they were like very very obliging birds and i could even shoot the bird with the mobile phone so that was the first sighting a very important sighting for me and also very few pictures were there i think from our um, from us uh, from our birders on that time so anyway uh, that was done and then uh, then after 2 3 years when i uh, look for the bird uh, for these pictures to like you know kind of see for some more pictures i felt i i, I realized that that hard drive is corrupted it's gone so <laughs> i i was feeling oh my god now what and then again i started looking for for this bird to make him do this pictures any i had some few pictures because actually harkirat singh uh, harkirat harkirat sanga ji he used to him so that was kind of a blessing so i had that saved somewhere else um uh, so i had a couple of pictures but not very good pictures and then later on i tried for it in shoal bay then kurma dera beach all this are very probable area in uh, andamans for this uh, sightings and then finally uh, i got this particular photograph is from diglipur one of the island of diglipur area uh, where we had again couple of them uh, sighted and they really if you are really careful to approach them they give a lot of time they are not very shy but we need to uh, slowly slowly approach it take your time and then approach it so that was uh, this one then uh, this you learn attaches like um, it was also a kind of sighting which i think um, um, was very uh, very very lucky sighting for us as i am concerned so we were birding in one long and looking for godless case bunting black headed green finch and the one more what was that huh? black, black browed uh, bushtit these were the three birds which um, many like manoj atul uh, they were all, uh, atul jain they were all like kind of um, um, had given me an idea of to look for and uh, they also gave um, me uh, like where to look for uh, 
uh, certain areas to look for whatever. So uh, finally, um, Alka was also there, Alka Vedya. So they all gave a lot of good information about it. And then finally, um, we, we were birding from helmet top. So within the first hour, all these three birds are done. And then we were like, what we did was that we uh, went by vehicle to the top and then we started uh, walking down. So uh, we got the first uh, the tit, uh, um, uh, bush tit first time, I, I mean, first bird, then bunting and then uh, green finch over all over the pine trees. So we were slowly walking and then we saw cochlear pheasant. I couldn't get a picture, but I really saw the bird um, uh, that eastern uh, whatever subspecies or uh, I think Somadi has a very good picture of it. So um, uh, we were walking down and then uh, we saw a lot, the flock of nuthatches. So then, uh, I mean, I I was not sure which nuthatch is it and I was not paying really, really very attention also. Like, okay, what kind of, any, what, um, I have a habit of like clicking whatever birds is possible within my limits. You know, whenever I see something, I have that um, tendency to click the birds. So anyway, when we saw this bird, we, it felt very uh, different uh, for us. Even Ch Chavang was, uh, was mentioning that it is like a Krasalski is probably Krasalski's nuthatch. Uh, so because it was not one of the nuthatches we, we had, we are familiar to earlier. Uh, so we made very good pictures and then I came back uh, to Bangalore and then I sat with uh, all the books available with me and then I found that oh, it's a Yunnan attach and um, it's probably the first sighting for, for the country. So yeah, so this is one um, beautiful sighting which, um, you know, um, I, I became a medium for that, uh, for, for people to look forward to this uh, regular sightings of the Nathatch uh, at the later point of time in Walong. Um, then Kashmir Nathatch. So uh, this is also not very easy Nathatch as um, many of us uh, birders know. So um, there are possible areas of uh, these in US Mark and also in Dachigam. Um, so um, I'd missed it. I probably had seen it once, but uh, I, without a good photo, I really do not feel it as a sighting. Uh, though I kind of take it sometime, uh, though if, whenever I am very, very sure. Otherwise, I do not um, uh, take it as one my bird, which I've seen. For me, a photograph is very important. So um, Nathach, uh, I tried and then James, uh, I think James Ethan has some very good pictures in Gaurav Kataya, uh, all from Yus Marg. So uh, I had seen all these pictures and uh, uh, find, uh, when I went for uh, looking for the orange bullfinch, that was in February, um, February. Yeah, so that was one of the times, uh, you know, good time to look for orange bullfinch. So um, Nasirji was uh, with, with me. So we had uh, good sightings of the bullfinch, uh, very beautiful uh, sightings in the Tachigam area. And um, also um, um, we had a big uh, trek in the Dachigam park uh, to look for the nuthatch because uh, so much, I mean, probable area for the pine trees, etc. But then we dipped the bird. So what happened was that um, uh, that time I got a, when I woke up, I had a very bad uh, neck sprain, neck and shoulder sprain. So I could not, um, so at, uh, before the trip actually, so in the flight when I traveled from Bangalore, um, actually I had a neck sprain, but it was kind of okay. I had a, I had a patch on the shoulder, so I was kind of fine. But uh, after that uh, first day of like uh, looking for the bullfinch and the, and the nut hatch, uh, that track, uh, that trek, as well as the probably a uh, little bit sweating, etc., might have aggravated it. And then by the end of the day, I was not able to move my shoulders at all. Just like I was, that was right shoulder, so I was not able to kind of lift the camera. Um, so uh, the next day, I had to go to uh, uh, Nasirji said that Yusmarg is a very good area to sight it, and it was fully covered with snow. So my, my shoulder had a problem. So I, anyway, I took a tablet and I went. Um, and uh, we had to really uh, wade through the knee full uh, snow to, um, to check for the pine trees where there are hunting flocks and uh, possible sightings. So anyway, finally got it along with um, uh, white cheeked Nathaj. All of them were there and uh, this beautiful sighting had happened. Um, so I was very, very happy to see this uh, Nathach uh, and uh, get an image, but the shoulder was really, really giving a problem to me. And then another point was that I was about to go to Jammu to click uh, the Rook uh, flock, which, had, uh, which is seen in Jammu area, Garana. 
so parvesh uh, shagu is a very um, uh, many of you might know him as very good enthusiastic birder and a ranger from um, a forest a forest officer from jammu so he has kindly agreed me to um, take um, uh, uh, agreed to take me along with him to the uh, to the place where the rooks were seen but like it was like impossible for me to lift uh, my shoulders again so what he did like the moment i landed in delhi we just directly went to the jammu hospital uh, one of the hospitals he knew and i got an injection on my shoulder uh, and uh, and then i went directly to the field where we got the rooks uh, the full of them but it was amazing uh, the way uh, you know uh, parvez uh, uh, took us uh, to that area and the kind of cooperation cooperation and um, uh, the kind of um, birding um, uh, experience which he had in that area was amazing beautiful, beautiful fields where these rooks were feeding and just like everywhere so since it was a life for me and i really kind of enjoy it and i do not uh, forget the sightings at all this natatch as well as the rook um the white cheeked natatch is a very beautiful natatch as we all know and there there is something uh, very very um, uh, jo uh, joyful when you see a life or by your own so when i was birding in narkanda and chitkul i had seen this bird oh my god this looks like literally different natatch okay uh, like i knew that white hair white tail uh, white cheek natatch of the natatches are there but i never thought that i would see it so when um, uh, i saw these natatches i was very ha happy you know to find a life or on our own um, a, a, you know that is a very important feeling so that is this one and then mountain scop saul this i gave from namdafa so this also had a very nice uh, kind of uh, story to it usually we we see this natatch i mean sorry the owls uh, we hear them uh, uh, usually in the northeast forest all the time like in the in in the in the tree in the canopy it's very very easy to uh, see them and very easy to miss so this was happening but i was not actually looking for the mountain scop owl because i thought okay this is kind of later bird for me it's not e easy to find anyway so we were after the dinner in namdafa we had uh, chavang is very basically very much interested in mammals so i kind of um, got that habit from chavang also so he uh, wanted to see some smaller mammals so we um, uh, we we kind of um, trekked uh, after the night not trekking actually after the dinner we were like just walking along the path and chavang ji was there and he was trying to um, look for slow loris then all this civet uh, uh, cats like smaller and the flying squirrels so one then like that fly, uh, just uh, then we were uh, looking uh, and this random torch flashlight we saw this bird just at our eye level it was not moving and it was just there mountain scop saul uh, was like right in front of us and then um, at the low level in very good light so i kind of clicked some images chavang also tried to click the images and what happened was that his settings was wrong and then um, he was telling he was mentioning it very jocularly jaini if it is really a mountain scop so i am really going to feel uh, the, the i mean feel, feel very very sad for this sighting because i don't have a picture of it my pictures have all come blank so anyway so that was it so um, uh, so this uh, mountain scop saul was such uh, a sighting which we have which we got in namdafa when we were actually looking for smaller mammals in the night and uh, common wood pigeon is also um, one of the last wood pigeons which i had uh, to click um, for uh, for india so uh, i think i had seen it in uh, dharamshala and trend uh, region um, flying but i wanted a perch shot so this like uh, we were trying to look for the i was with rajesh rajesh pamar we were coming from munsiari we had a very very wonderful um, birding session uh, with a lot of cheer pheasants and all other lamer gear vulture with bones all that cracking the bones etc so uh, when we were coming down um, on the path, like near this place thal we, we just saw this bird uh, sitting uh, one of the uh, on the pine trees so we thought first our hunch was that it's like uh, ashy wood pigeon so like it's ashy wood pigeon but ashy wood pigeon is also a very good bird so we thought like okay we should get a uh, good bird uh, pictures of this bird and then we stopped the car we got down and then we saw it's a, it's a good common wood pigeon and it's not only one bird it's 
all over the place like a field full of them they were coming to feed in the field and taking off, off in circles so we just had a lovely time with them and lots of them like thousands of them i think rajesh made a wonderful video of it so um, that was one beautiful uh, sighting we got and later on abhinav also abhinav dr abhinav choudhury uh, he also had found uh, several regions for this um, birds um, in in near mandi area uh, you know where um, he is stationed right now i think so um, yeah so there are several areas where if we want to really now to look for we can always try to get this bird but to get that kind of information we need a lot of people to work i mean especially dr abhinav choudhury and all he has done a lot of exclusive work um, in in that area to get us what we need um nicobar scorpion is another bird which we had no information about and uh, is like this is one of the exploratory uh, one of my first trip uh, to great nicobar archipelago i think i was one of the first birders uh, to go there to explore there and we had no idea about uh, the call of the bird the habitat nothing so like vikram shi he also had very good with night birds so after the dinner we were just looking for in just going for uh, some owling whatever we call and then we saw a lot of hooded pita chicks very beautifully perched in the night you know uh, on this climbing uh, climbing bamboo i think it's called so on these bamboos they were like different aged pitas like you know from the smallest juvenile to mid aged uh, i mean to like like that you know we we got a many many nicobar hooded pitas that night and finally we saw this uh, nicobar scops owl and we didn't know what owl it was but then you know we felt it is nicobar scops owl uh, back after i mean that time and also then we reached it after coming back to the to the guest house so that is how we found uh, this nicobar scops owl and uh, very very happy so that time it was like one of the few images clicked um, in the subcontinent then corn crake was another uh, another kind of lucky sighting <laughs> which i would say uh, so angit vikrant i think um, is one of the researchers um, which is uh, which is who used to do a lot of work in um, in spiti area um, so abhinav dr abhinav also had a lot of um, kind of birding sessions or kind of interactions with him so he had given um, some kind of um, information about a particular uh, about these areas where concrete could be seen so earlier only one picture i think which i am familiar with uh, was uh, shantanu prasad this uh, uh, one picture from uh, leh ladakh i think sokar area when one one picture that's all i was like kind of um, knew about uh, this corn crake uh, from the subcontinent so anyway me and our abhinav uh, we were looking for this bird we had a lot of area uh, we had to cover a lot of area wherever like you know um, the the a little bit streams and a little bit um, marshy area was there we we were kind of trying to cover that so we were looking for this uh, several uh, areas in spiti area kasa many areas so once we found the bylon crake um uh, so then we we were we were actually kind of shooting all the crakes possible because we didn't know that a little like crake was also a life for for us so uh, uh, whether it become will will become a little crake later so we are clicking every crake which we found even though we were sure that sabelon crake still we were making images of it um, thinking that maybe it could be a little crake you know like that so uh, these kind of search were going on and what happened was that uh, when um, uh, uh, once uh, in that uh, area uh, abhinav uh, told me that okay uh, jenny i had seen this uh, one juvenile kind of bailon crake so i was birding the opposite area and he was in some other area so he told me he called me by phone and he told me that that fortunately that range was there so he told me that uh, there's a small uh, i mean a juvenile kind of bailon crake it is juvenile bailon crake only but sure but still if you want to make sure or have a picture you come to this area i can show you the place so um i reached there within like 10 15 minutes and then uh, he told me this is exact place we should look for because they were feeding in that area so there was a small kind of a rock then i, I i just sat on the rock uh, waiting patiently for this uh, bailon crake to the juvenile bailon crake to to uh, uh, come out then uh, abhinav uh, he just went to the other si uh, side uh, side for birding uh, then after like 15 20 minutes i was waiting for this uh, crake and then suddenly through the so 
then uh, I didn't want to move so much because Craig's, uh, as we know, they are very, very um, uh, skittish birds. So I slowly raised the camera and I was looking the Craig basically through the camera lens. So in much of the situations I do that because I can minimize the movement that way. If I have the camera in one hand and then use it as a kind of binocul binoculars, then that's easy for me to handle the shots uh, as and when it happens. So I was looking at scanning the field through the uh, camera when I saw this small, the head popped, one, uh, one head uh, popped up like this. And I first thought it's a watercock. Wow, watercock in this area. Oh, it's, it's a nice sighting, probably it's a nice record. So like that, I am focusing on the water cock to come out. And then slowly, slowly the head comes, uh, it's becomes clear, it is becoming visible to me clearly. So then the full body comes and then I figure out it's concrete. Oh my God, it is like excitement. And out of that excitement, I could not even like, you know, uh, greatly, I mean, focus exactly on the, on the kind of shots which I want. But because I didn't want to spook the bird as well. I wanted it to be in a clear uh, angle for me to get some good pictures. So I uh, slowly it just uh, came in front of me, then it just um, crossed a small stream and walked uh, towards the other, I mean, trotted towards the other side. So I made some pictures and then immediately I called, I mean, uh, Dr. Abhinav and then he came running like within 15 minutes, he was there. He was somewhere else and then with bated breath, he came running. And then again, we waited the whole day. And by evening, I think we got uh, some glimpse of it again. And then uh, I think the next day, Dr. Abhinav got a sighting also. So that was how the concrete happened. And then later, uh, so that happened in September. And the next, uh, and that January, the next January, we got the little crate from Jamnagar. And thank, many thanks to Ashunji for that. And then afterwards, little cray, everywhere it was raining, little crake. I used to tell even Ronit uh, Datta you know, from Mumbai that you, you find me a little crake, then I will I'll come to a uh, bird for I mean, I really wanted that bird. So it's like then afterwards, I have several sightings, but uh, all these first sightings was like kind of um, very, um, very unforgettable. And uh, this one, uh, black belly sand grouse, uh, again from the famous Netsi village, we were lying down on the on the lake floor to get a very good image of this. Dr. Abhinav was there with us. He, he used to go very early in the morning because previous birders like Rajneesh and all, we had, they had told us like you know, they're very shy and so we have to be like well in time and be very camouflage as possible uh, to get good shots. So that is how we made this um, black bellied sandgrouse images so then again um, uh, so we, we we missed on the spotted sandgrouse so again the next month uh, I, I, I again went for the spotted sandgrouse and four days i was looking for the bird but it wouldn't turn up and uh, one uh, so just um, that one of the day the uh, the last, I think third day uh, when i was looking for the i was still standing in the um, uh, near the lake bed when i saw a flock of the um, chestnut bellied sand grouse they were coming to drink water and then this peregrine peregrine falcon was just you know just appeared from somewhere and then dive bombed into that flock and then caught one and then uh, decapitated it midair and then shot past me so that was the image taken at that time uh, so this is also like you know uh, I'm, I'm very happy to get this shot because peregrine falcon one of the fastest animals on the earth um, with the sand grouse kill was something like very beautiful for me and um, yeah, so the next day I, I saw the spot, spotted sand grouse, uh, but uh, and very far, not like the baby see it in GRK, but they had come and uh, they were like kind of uh, drinking uh, the water from the Ned Sea Lake. Then Bukun Leo Sikla, one of the sort, sought after birds uh, which we uh, have, uh, one of our, the birds of our pride basically uh, from Eagle Nest. So this was also a lot of walking and like a lot of running around to get this. Sometimes we get lucky, Some most of the times we are not. So this time again, it was in December. And uh, so they basically, um, uh, they have the habit of, I think the Bukit Leosi class can be seen along with the flock of the rusty fronted barwing. So that was in, new to me. So but Rafiq knew all this. So whenever, so the first thing which Rafiq basically looked forward to is like kind of track um, the uh, rusty bellied short wings. They listen to their calls and then try to fo follow that, uh, the hunting flock. 
so that is how it which, which was happening and like we were running up we were climbing down all these things the whole day we did that and then we always missed that and at one point of time Rafiq told me that ma'am this is the area probably they will cross you just kind of cross the path so you just focus on the tree trunk and that is how somebody has a Prasad Prasad I think Prasad Basavaraj he shot it ma'am so he did that so you also please keep focusing on that branch that is the kind of excitement which we had you know but then anyway the, uh, the flock didn't cross that path and we missed it and then towards the end of the day like about it was like fag and, and no light practically so that time we got an amazing sighting i had 500 mm in hand it was so close and with all the leaf and everything but still i'm so happy to make this picture of this beautiful bird so we had very wonderful sighting we had a lot of sights uh, sighting that um, uh, about two i think two birds were there but they were very, very free they were skittish they were not coming out but they were around huh. then mandarin duck it's one of the most beautiful ducks uh, which we have and so this one um, also like in little andaman um, i could the, the bird was there almost a month and still i could not uh, go because of some other commitments and finally when i reached little andaman we from the from the from the ship we directly went to this area and uh, i wanted so the bird was like sitting in in this kind of village fence it was not moving at all from there and there was an andaman andaman tail just down and uh, what happened was that i wanted it to just climb up the fence and give a very good picture and it was never happening like it was always in the same place it will just plop down to the water and then again climb back up to the same place so i didn't know what to do with that i wanted a clear picture with a very beautiful background so then what gokul krishna a great researcher in who was working in the zoological survey of india he was there with me actually so gokul told me ma'am so if you are brave enough probably we can just get into the lake and to, i am brave enough but there is a cro crocodile warning there in that uh, there's a board there so it's a little bit difficult situation but still anyway uh, he was brave and i was brave both of us were brave so we just went into the uh, to the to that lake uh, from one side and then approached it that is how we got this kind of background with the lilies in the pond so uh, in that lake so that uh, so that is how we made this picture then golden bush ramen i love this picture just to see, show you some uh, images which i really like um, so this was also um, a plant not a plant sighting we were looking for the golds uh, short wing um, in sela pass so the uh, they, it was very foggy that day so probably that maybe because of that these kind of, these birds really, really kind of came and uh, danced and uh, that is how like it's kind of displaying that is how i got this image then blight stragopan another um, beautiful stunner from the eastern himalayas again several times several years but look for it and uh, um, this also very um, i mean th that day we were trying to look for it for sure i agree because um, we had uh, uh, i mean after resorting to the normal methods of uh, uh, looking for this bird in the early morning late in the evening uh, in the foraging area etc we were not able to see this bird so we had decided to trek up the mountain path which would basically lead to uh, the road down below so we tried to take that path and then come down to the road where the vehicle would pick us up so this happened and uh, while in the path chavan chavan was there um, then uh, another researcher from um, ncb sunita she was there so we were all there uh, looking for this bird and the local guide also um, so then anyway we we finished the trek and we were on the road and then we walked a couple of uh, kilometers to uh, to reach the car uh, we were wa walking towards the car actually so that time our local guide he kind of saw something red in the bamboo below so uh, he told it something like a blight struck upon he told and we were all looking at that and then we felt it's a red bright colored leaf there then it moved oh my god it is like an excitement you know and then we suddenly took um, uh, the the cover of a culvert there and then um, uh, waited for the bird to sort of again hope against the hope that the bird will cross the road and then we'll be able to make a picture so we were waiting and then just as we predicted the bird slowly started coming and when the bird was about to give a full view a truck came from the opposite side and all spoiled but fortunately the bird didn't fly off it just took a turn and then went back so that is the time i made this picture then western tragopan as we all know one of the most beautiful birds which we can see 
and this was also not easy so um, just to give you a, a, an idea so um, they, we, we saw a couple of them uh, in the down in the pine um, so what happened was that like we, in, though we were searching for it like uh, see the birds very 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 uh, shy manals were shy there were a lot of manals himalayan manals out there and any slightest noise we make uh, like the rustle on the leaf litter on the forest forest floor they were all like kind of very very determining that time so the monarchs were taking off and then you know all the pheasants in that area were taking off so i was like kind of mentally very disappointed to see i mean like i thought that okay maybe i will not be able to see this bird um, so that was the kind of uh, you know uh, mental agony i would say that i was going through and finally like you know when the bird appeared it was like kind of a great sighting um, and uh, we saw the pair but the female was like you know, very shy but the male gave a lot of time that and a lot of time in some time to click us uh, click good birds i mean good pictures um, so the point was that again i i kind of uh, felt that i should not uh, press the shutter uh, till the bird is like you know uh, is in full uh, visibility and uh, we have very good frame because otherwise it could spook the bird and we may not get i mean a bird shot at all like in you know, a worthwhile shot at all then black necked crane as you know just to show you some pictures now um like very 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 nice in that settings and uh, this i think in the uh, in last september i saw um, a pair of them with uh, rearing two chicks i hope the chicks survived but that was a great setting then some frames to sh just show you common rose finch from chitkul this intense color of this rose finches which we see out in chitkul is not what we see in the south so it's a different subspecies i think then orange breasted green pigeon one of my favorite pigeons um, i remember that my first birding trip to uh, goa like garibas was there uh, with us so we it was a group birding trip and then i wanted i, I told garima that i just wanted to see this orange breasted green pigeon in goa and then she said orange breasted green pigeon in goa okay probably maybe like that so that was the first time we saw the orange uh, breasted green pigeon like when we were returning from the suari river cruise and this was made from manas but it's a very beautiful pigeon which i really like an andaman wood pigeon very difficult uh, pigeon i would say uh, to get this so this was made from the kachal island um i mean maybe the bird was not aware of like you know our approaching so i was able to make this uh, close shot um, usually we see it in like canopy or uh, they, they are like uh, i think their population decline is probably due to hunting we don't know exactly but it's uh, becoming increasingly rarer to see these birds again and again i mean these times um andaman teal again shy birds they take off from far so this is one of the my favorite shots of this teal even andaman tree pie very hard uh, very uh, um see we, we see them but sometimes it's very difficult to get them a good sh get a sh good shot because they might not come down uh, as we need it and i'm at kukuda i like this frame this is from kamorta island but uh, yeah it's a little bit reddish i think compared to the andaman subspecies and it's one of my another favorite picture of the white breasted wood swallows um, they were like looking for the grub in the in the slide to drizzle so i really like this picture and some um, blighted pictures in the snow like i like that beautiful rose pink against the uh, snow then uh, grandala also um, like very very difficult uh, to see um, uh, like even we look for that bird in the wrong time of the year at the wrong place so i had uh, several uh, you know um, kind of trips to see this at uh, and a very good lev uh, eye level so that this uh, i think it's uh, this happened in february this year as one of the last birding trips which i had in this year i would say uh, so yeah uh, aditya was kind enough to uh, show us uh, take us to different places in lachung lachung and lachan area where they used to come and feed on these berries and we got amazing sightings of the flocks and thousands um what's trogon um, one of the beautiful birds uh, so sometimes when we see trogons in eagle nest we see a lot of them sometimes we do not see at all so for me i think what's trogon for like you know it was uh, i i have uh, very good sightings from different places um, um but yeah this was the time when i kind of made a good photograph
and um, yeah so it gave all sort of pose that was with rafiq uh, in mishmi like you know it, the bird was not going from there it was just so comfortable and uh, we were able to make uh, as much as angle as many as uh, we want we wanted and uh, malabar throw gone again from tateka this also like um, you know i had 500000 i mean 2x on 500 that day so i got that kind of you know a background with a painting kind of feeling and i really like this shot and i think as far as i am concerned one of the most difficult throw gone for me is like you know from uh, for, from our, our indian throw gone such as the red headed throw gone oh my god i really tried to um, make good pictures from namdafa then what um, uh, from eagle nest uh then also from jepo i mean the dihingpat kai uh, area many times but i think last year we got a very good picture from um, jepo forest area dihingpat kai uh, with binanda but yeah i think of all the trogons for me red headed was the most difficult one even from mizoram we got that mizoram sub subspecies but it was really difficult i think uh, these uh, malabar trogon and the what's trogon are still more uh, obliging i like this frame because it's the uh, habitat is very very um you know uh, kind of um, um very um, appealing in that another tail mean la yeah to the tail the green kochua the kochuas are like um, like again like you know for the purple kochua we uh, we had an amazing sighting in may um, 2016 like on the row rock just along the road it is just on the rock and we we were not able to uh, click it you know the rafiq was that ma'am it's kochua that then the purple kochua and that uh, we just could not because we were in the vehicle and the bird just flew and that was the first time i had a very good um, uh, you know sighting of kochua right beside the road uh, in like you know, towards the fag end of the day um, we uh, of course made a picture but a little bit like far into the uh, bamboo thickets but that sighting i will never forget it was like just a bush chart like a bush chart how they behave on the road that is how it was sitting uh, just on a small boulder um, along in the on the side of the road but we missed that shot later i got some good shots but um, that sighting i will never forget this is a green kochua from um, mizoram one of my favorite shots of the lesser roof side at that and white bright proud piculet from assam hello to it uh, from mishmi hills these are some 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 shots which i wanted to show just like that and a very colorful sunbird um, this is like uh, i think one of the first time i had seen this uh, white tail sunbird was from mainam uh, wildlife sanctuary in sikkim and then chavang was there with me and i was so so happy to see its long tail you know uh, so to to uh, to really appreciate that sunbirds can be so beautiful like that then i had got some good pictures from east sikkim pyongnoxla national park and then like in you know, several parts of the northeast and this one was from tawang and this is like uh, mrs cold sunbird this is also like from hile uh, from sikkim so that time i had a lot of lifers like a uh, not lot of lifers i i think yes um the rusty bellied short wing the white throat short wing and then fulvus uh, parrot bill these were all like you know um lifers uh, for me from that trip and but i like this picture because the the sunbird was kind of trying to preen you know, or i don't know what it was doing uh it was like slightly uh, it was foggy and then uh, i like this image uh, a lot and so uh, it's a roller uh, from assam and i'm a more falcon as we know that we see them in like like uh, like thousands and ten thousands in in pangti valley in um, uh, in nagaland so that day also we saw a lot of them but you know somehow i wanted a kind of perch shots Uh, and then we kind of uh, tried to we went by a boat then reached the other side then climbed up that hill so that the near that roosting area where uh, they they were coming to roost i mean perch rather not roost actually perch and then that is how i made this image uh, so that was time that was one of the first time i made good shots of the amur falcon and that was uh, in november and that particular year in december as a wonderful sighting in malambura in in kerala in palakkad uh, area so i was thinking you know um, okay we went all, all the way to uh, get get some good shots of the amur falcon from 
um, uh, from Nagaland and it's just right in, in our backyard now. But still, this feeling you, the feeling you get when you see them in flocks and flocks in, in Pangti Valley is unmatchable to compare to any other kind of uh, sightings like one or two or like in 15, 20, it's, it's, it's a different sighting. So I'm happy to see that. And there's some amazing sighting which I had that time. And this is a rufous fronted tit from Lachan. I also like this image a lot. And that's it, I think, like, but um, before, um, before concluding, I, I would say uh, um, that without the help of this lot of, um, you know, my friends, my birders, naturalists, nothing would have been possible. Um, so I thank all of them. And also I thank Nikhil uh, Deva sir uh, to kind of um, give me an opportunity uh, to be in this forum, uh, to present something. Uh, I hope it had been helpful to you. Uh, I uh, just, you know, felt like to share something, uh, some uh, sightings which I really kind of cherish. That's what I did today and that's all from me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. That was such a fantastic talk. Love seeing all your fantastic images. The chat box has now been open. So in case anyone has a few questions that they'd like to ask Jenny, you can type them in the chat box. Uh, meanwhile, I can just make a couple of quick announcements. Right, so as most of you would know, uh, the recordings of all talks of the Delhi Bird Foundation are now available on our YouTube channel, which is Delhi Bird Foundation. So you can just go and subscribe there to see recordings of all the previous talks, as well as the recording of this talk. And next week, we have Dhritiman Mukherjee, another giant biscuit session. This is also going to be the last talk of the Delhi Bird Foundation talk series. So would love to have all of you join us for this last talk next Sunday on 27th September at 5 p.m. Okay, let's see if you have any questions coming in. Okay, Okay, so the first question we have Jenny coming in is from Nitin is which bird would you like to photograph again? Again, I mean, the ones which I, which I have shot and then again, yeah. I want to improve. I think I have almost all the birds again. I don't mind good pictures. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um, or maybe uh, yeah. which one is the next on your wish list? Like which one you, are you get to photograph or you, you really want to see next? I have like, you know, uh, pictures like Chinese Franklin's. Um, I have seen it in Mizor Mizoram, I think, I like, cannot see it, but I still want to make a picture of that to make sure then, of course, green prepin for pea hole, then um, eastern grass owl. I have some pictures, but, you know, something which I really want, especially from the southern region of India. Um, so what I have is from Manipur, but uh, I want to have some from uh, southern region. Uh, then, of course, Jordan's Coaster, uh, everybody's, uh, every birder's dream. Um, yeah, so there are many and many pelagic birds, for example. So yeah, I have a lot of things to do. Yep. And like following up on that question, which would be perhaps the first place you'd want to visit once the COVID pandemic is over? Okay. Uh, right now, I just wish for it uh, to end at the earliest, but always I, you know, kind of uh, want to go for like, you know, Andaman and Nicobas. So, you know, anybody ask me anytime. I would always suggest, uh, I mean, I would always want to go to Nicobar uh, Islands. Um, yeah. Okay. Another question from Rima is, how often do you have to make a trip to a particular place to get the word that you want? Um, yes. Um, the point is... Um, it depends. So my uh, my kind of birding style is that I go again and again and again and again and again till I get a satisfactory uh, shot. So that is how most of the these birds become very very uh, dear to me. Um, like for example, I mentioned about snowcock, about golden eagle, about white browed tit wobbler. I mean, you ask me about any bird, I've I've, I've done a lot of uh, kind of trips um, uh, to a particular area. Uh, over many years to make such shots. So it doesn't happen in a single day. 
but certain uh, sightings, as I mentioned, also like had come like a very surprise for me, like Malayan Malay night heron, for example. I, I waited some seven, eight years to make a good shot of it, but that first sighting and that first shot was also important. So it depends actually. So it doesn't, um, I cannot pinpoint how many trips, but uh, I, I am very, very, um, you know, I just you know, persistent in that. I keep on going to the same place again and again. Okay, we have a few questions coming in about the photography gear that you use. So if you could just tell the viewers what cameras, lenses you use to make these yeah, images. Uh, right now, I use a Canon 1DX, um, uh, 1DX and a 1DX Mark II. Uh, because Mark II is very good for uh, making videos. Uh, I, I got that just because I um, had the um, uh, opportunity to go to Papua New Guinea and uh, Papua for uh, Birds of Paradise. So to get the videos, I uh, tried to use uh, the Mark II or uh, one. And uh, the lenses which are used as ca Canon um, 300 f2.8, especially for wren babblers and very uh, fast moving birds. And also, um, um, I mean, for all major purposes, uh, practical pur purposes, I use Canon F500 F4 uh, with the combination of um, converter, either 1.4 or 2x. Okay, I don't think we have any more questions coming in. So maybe we'll close the talk here. Thank you so much, Jenny, for taking out the time and for sharing your photography journey with us. Uh, we hope to see all of you next week for the last Telebird talk series, which is going to be with Jitiman. Uh, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Sure. Thank you so much. And yeah, so we look forward to the next talk. Yeah, it would be really great to see his, um, and to see his pictures and his, listen to his, his experiences. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Bye. Uh -huh. yeah. Bye.